Ancient Rome is one of history's most iconic civilizations, but in its past is a bag of bizarre practices that would make the skin crawl of those in the modern world. Join us as we unearth 20 ancient, bizarre, and disgusting practices that were considered normal in ancient Rome. Number 20. Feeding the Dead Not sure what archaeologists were looking for in ancient Roman graves when they discovered that these people fed their dead for the afterlife. In grave sites, there was food, especially meat from animals. According to legislators, a grave is not a grave unless there was an animal offering to the goddess Ceres. Some people speculated that the animal must be a pig, and so while excavating burial sites, archaeologists expected to see pig remnants in them. But they were surprised to see different animals, including a fox, an animal most people won't dare eat. If we consider the words of a Roman poet, Ovid, who said, Good Ceres is content with little, if that little be but pure. We might never get to understand what pure means to goddess Ceres. Because how can fox and pure coexist in the same sentence? Well, let's not get into the pure goddess's head. Let's focus on why we are here. Feeding the dead is a tradition of the Romans, and they even go as far as pouring honey, wine, and food into the grave of the deceased through a pipe. This was done to appease people they thought might have forgiven them in the afterlife, and also to provide for their loved ones in years to come. If you think this ancient practice is bizarre, then you have not heard about the next one. Number 19. They drank gladiators' sweat. I know you won't even hug your sweaty friend because you don't want your skin to be in contact with their sweat. Well, be thankful you were not born in Rome about 1,000 years ago. That's because the same way hardcore fans of celebrities would pay premium dollars for a strand of hair from their idols was the same way famous gladiators' sweat was idolized. The dirt and sweat gathered from the skin of great gladiators would be collected and put into vials. These vials would then be sold outside arenas, and wealthy women were the typical patrons. However, the gladiator sweat wasn't merely purchased as a collector's item. Back in the day, gladiators were men, mostly slaves who fought for entertainment. While some were just average fighters, some were successful. Ancient Romans believed that gladiator sweat was an effective aphrodisiac, the successful ones to be precise. After each fight, before the gladiators cleaned themselves, a tool called a strigil was used to scrape off sweat from their bodies. They believed that the more successful a gladiator was in the arena, the more potent their fluids were to use as an aphrodisiac. Women would also purchase vials of sweat and use it as facial cream to improve their complexion. Often, the grime and sweat were mixed with olive oil to achieve a better consistency and mixed into cosmetics. If the potency of gladiator sweat was confirmed, would you be trying it out? Number 18. Anyone who broke his vow could be killed. What do you know about vigilantism? Whatever you know, just know it was more difficult for the ancient Romans. You see, every man was expected to abide by his oaths and vows, and failure to do so was considered a sacrilege. Once a man breaks his vows, he would be considered an outcast. The rule of the ancient Romans' vigilante groups included declaring a man homo sacra, meaning one who's an outcast if he was ever found breaking his vows. The first thing that would happen to anyone found guilty is losing all of his legal rights, which includes owning a property. After that, he would be open to being killed by anyone without holding the murderer responsible for the death. In case you didn't get it, a man who was accused of cheating his client would be declared homo sacra, and at any time of the day, week, month, or year, someone who's got beef with him or who had been jealous of him would use that opportunity to strike him and end his life. Just imagine being in a place you call home and having to watch your back 247. Simply say anyone declared homo sacra is a walking corpse. Number 17. They had regular vomiting sessions. What makes a person vomit? Maybe they are sick or they got irritated by something. Also happens when one is too full of eating or drinking. It's just something that doesn't happen every time. Scratch that, it happened every time with the ancient Romans. I mean, these people vomited regularly just so they could free their stomachs. The Roman philosopher Seneca famously said, The Romans weren't shy about vomiting. They vomit so that they may eat and so that they may vomit. That must be the weirdest thing you have heard today. Even the wealthy Romans in silk garments go about eating in half-lying positions around a richly set table, all just to throw up after and continue eating to throw up some more. How is that even possible? 
See, the ancient Romans ate like it was their purpose in life. Their lavish feasts often lasted for several days, during which enormous amounts of food were consumed. And of course, their eating marathons required a simple technique, vomiting. When they were too full to eat and drink anymore, they would go to the toilet and make themselves sick. The most annoying part is that some Romans didn't even bother to leave the table. Instead, they vomited in pots or on the floor. The rich ones with servants would call on the servants they had assigned as vomit collectors to crawl under the table and clean up the mess. You'd agree that this is a very weird practice that can't be normal in this age, but was considered normal in the past. Just imagining that alone. Let's take a minute to puke. Number 16. They performed brain surgery without anesthesia. You may not be a medical practitioner, but you definitely know what surgery means. A surgery involves using a surgical blade on the affected part of a body, slitting it open to work on the inside, then having it stitched up again. You must agree that it would be very painful even if you haven't experienced it before. This is why doctors use anesthesia on the patients to keep them from feeling pain during the surgical procedure. But guess what? The ancient Romans decided to perform surgery and brain surgery without the use of anesthesia. First off, let's give these people accolades for their great knowledge in performing brain surgery at a time when medicine had not advanced. I mean, that's mind-blowing, but the ones who needed the most accolades are their patients. How on earth did they endure such pain? When the archaeologists found skulls showing the healed marks of surgery, they couldn't believe their eyes. And on top of a successful operation, the healed marks proved that the patient survived the operation. The archaeologists found another skull of a 20-year-old patient in northern Greece dating back to around 800 BC, which showed that the patient survived at least 20 years after skull surgery. At the time, the surgical operation that took place didn't use a drill but a special tool sculpting inside the skull in a way that cleaned all debris and fixed cracks on the skull. One of the skulls that was found from 200 BC belonged to a man of 50 years old who had brain surgery using the drilling method. Again, for this patient, the skull was cured while evidence for infection was minimal. The patient also survived for at least five to six years. What the scientists still do not understand is what had been used instead of anesthesia in the past, since having brain surgery without anesthesia would have been intolerable and most probably impossible. Maybe just maybe there was a trick to that. But whatever they did shows some great intelligence and skill. Number 15. They threw unwanted kids in the garbage dump. Who would dare throw a baby away because they don't want them? No way. It is considered an abominable cruelty, and such a person would definitely go to jail for that. But in the ancient Romans' case, they considered throwing unwanted babies away in the garbage dump a normal practice. At the time, many children died a few days after birth because of heavy childbirth or diseases. For that, the ancient Romans waited a bit before giving a name to the child just to be sure the child would survive. Before the child received a name, they weren't considered fully human, and the head of the family known as Paterfamilias decided the date of the newborn. In Roman society, the paterfamilias had absolute control over the baby's life and could leave the baby to die with no legal consequences. The Romans abandoned unwanted babies on the street or threw them in the garbage. Yeah, they engaged in infanticide, and they saw absolutely nothing wrong about it. Even Romulus, the founder of Rome, and his twin brother Remus were abandoned by their mother as babies. But fortunately for them... A she-wolf saved them and suckled them until they were adopted by the shepherd Faust Ullus and his wife. In the 8th century, Romulus then decreed that no child could be killed before his third year unless he was deformed. Are you trying too hard to make sense out of this? Well, that makes two of us, because just how did a society see infanticide as normal? Number 14. Public Toilet and Sponges the ancient Roman toilet systems are a few of the things that could be associated with the modern world. While they weren't exactly like modern ones, they still used pioneering sewage networks that are still replicated in the world over to this day. Applying what had been done by the Etruscans before them, the Romans devised a sanitation system using covered drains to carry stormwater and sewage out of Rome. 
Eventually, this system of sanitation was reproduced across the empire and was declared by the contemporary historian Pliny the Elder to be the most noteworthy of all the ancient Romans' achievements. This feat of engineering allowed public baths, toilets, and latrines to spring up across ancient Rome. But you see, what we can't just see as normal is the manner and way they cleaned up after using the toilet. There was no toilet paper. Can you guess what took its place? Let me help you with that. A sea sponge on a stick. Yeah, you heard right. Just imagine you have to clean up using a sea sponge on a stick. Let's just get out of the toilet and wait for civilization. Number 13. Toothpaste was made from honey and crushed bones. If you're getting worried about the ancient Romans' hygiene because of all you have learned about them today, you should worry about yourself respectfully. One thing those people didn't joke with was their hygiene and their oral hygiene to be precise. They recognized the value of maintaining healthy teeth and fresh breath, which is why they developed intriguing methods to keep their teeth in good condition. The ancient Romans used frayed twigs, known as dental sticks or miswack, created from aromatic woods like cinnamon or olive. They chewed on one end of these twigs to create a brush-like consistency that they used to clean their teeth. And about the toothpaste, they used various substances to clean their teeth. One common paste consisted of crushed bones and oyster shells mixed with water, serving as an abrasive agent to remove plaque. Some also used a mixture of honey and powdered charcoal to polish their teeth. Even in the modern world, dentists recommend the use of charcoal powder to whiten the teeth, which shows that it was a very good discovery, but what we can't understand is the mixture of honey, crushed bones, oyster shells, and charcoal. Would you love to try it out, though? If you eventually use this combo and it works for you, don't hesitate to tell us about it. Number 12. Murderers were kept in sacks with snakes, dogs, roosters, and monkeys. The scariest thing about the ancient Romans must be their execution methods. Different offenses attract different types of punishment, but in ancient Roman history, all forms of execution are really messed up. If nothing at all, it shows that humans can occasionally be a little bit mean to each other. While no method of execution is exactly enjoyable, some of them are surely worse than others given how long and painful they end up being. A criminal getting sentenced to death in ancient times would be killed by strangulation, but for certain crimes, there were more severe punishments. A much more popular type was throwing people off the Tarpeian Rock, an eight-foot-high cliff from which traitors and murderers were flung. However, the most severe must be the execution for the crime of patricide, which means the murder of one's father. This particular method of execution is really horrific, and it makes one wonder how people who witnessed it didn't have trauma from it. The execution method is known as poena cule, which in Latin means penalty of the sack. It involves the convicted father murderer being put into a sack with several live animals and then having the sack thrown into the water. The animals include a rooster, a dog, and a monkey. One way or the other, the convicted would die because those animals won't sit down gently being friends with anyone in that situation. What a weird way of serving justice. Or do you think it was okay considering the offense? Number 11. Gladiator's blood is medicine. Just when you thought you had seen it all, the ancient Romans keep showing that they have more ways to get you thinking they came from a different planet entirely. The ancient medicine of the Romans once consisted of sacrificial offerings and divine petitions. They believed disease was a supernatural infliction and that health was a gift, which is different from how we see things today. To us, medicine is much more disease-centered and nothing spiritual. And even the way they treated their diseases, called spiritual problems, is nothing short of disgusting. They relied on the consumption of gladiator's blood or liver to cure epileptics. Yuck! Who made this horrible discovery? The ancient Romans have long believed in the gladiators forgetting that they were humans like them. They saw gladiators as humans more than humans, and thereby possessed supernatural healing powers. Once a gladiator is slain, they do not bury them immediately but take their liver and blood to be used for medicine. I wonder how the medicine would have been used and only hope it didn't have to pass through someone's tongue. Oh, gross. Number 10. Urine was used for laundry. While all we do with urine now is flush it down the drain, the ancient Romans had other plans. Normally, you run away from your own pee by washing your hands after using the toilet, but not the ancient Rome humans. They used human and animal urine in their everyday lives. 
For example, in the Roman Empire, it was normal to use human and animal urine as a mouthwash of sorts. Sounds gross, right? Definitely, but back in the day, people noticed that urine helps to maintain healthy and strong teeth. In fact, it even makes teeth whiter. Urine contains ammonia, which forms as bacteria break down urea. Ammonia is used in many commercial cleaning products as well as many pharmaceutical products. And as if that was not enough, ancient Romans used urine to wash some clothing. And they made sure the urine got old before it was used. The older the urine, the more effective it got. That's not all about the usage of urine. It was also used to dye leather and also as a fertilizer. Yeah, modern chemical fertilizers also have some of the same substances as human urine, but what we don't see as normal is the usage of urine in our laundry. Who keeps urine these days? Number 9. Brains for Dinner How can we talk about the bizarre practices of the ancient Romans without mentioning their food? While these humans had varieties of food to feast on till they vomited, a particular choice comfortably made its way to this list, brains. Relax, not the human brain, but that doesn't even make it any simpler or less messy than it already is. While the Romans didn't choose any animal's brain, they chose the pure, gentle lamb. It was a special way to enjoy their dinner at the time, and they did this in a variety of ways. Sometimes they boil or bake it, and sometimes they do all manner of things to it. One Apicius recipe even calls for lamb brain, eggs, pepper, and rose petals. This shows they considered eating lamb brains as normal in the past. Would you love to have a plate of brains for dinner? I'll answer on your behalf. No thanks, we'll pass. Number 8. Dining on Exotic Animals Oh, before we leave the Romans' diet, this is another bizarre practice of the ancient Romans. The most you can easily get in a butcher shop today is either beef, pork, or chicken. Supermarkets can take things up a bit by including turkey or lamb in their lists of meat. But long ago in Rome, they dined on snails, guinea fowl, geese, ducks, hares, rabbits, pheasants, wild boar, venison, and partridges. They also appreciate other animals and their parts, which takes things a little out of this world. This includes chicken livers, pork cheeks, calf tongue, flamingo tongues, stuffed dormice, roasted parrots, and moray eel. These animals are exotic. Maybe the Romans believed every animal must end up on their platters. Even the ancient Roman cookbook contains recipes for sauces of crane, turtle dove, flamingo, and various other exotic birds, even parrots. Too sad. Number 7. Garum. Fermented fish sauce. We would leave what the ancient Romans ate, but this one cannot be overlooked. Meet garum, the fermented fish sauce. Garum is a term that refers to several kinds of fish sauces very popular in ancient Rome. Just take it as the ketchup of the Roman world. Originally, garum was made with small fish like sardines and mackerel, along with brine and plenty of thyme. Garum is actually not supposed to be on this list, but the method of preparation gives it every right. The fish has to be extremely fresh, and enough salt must be added to make at least 20 to 25% of the liquid obtained in the end. It is fundamental to stir the fish each day about three to four times and keep it well soaked in its liquid. And it would take about two to three months in the container staying under the sun to make it ferment. The question is, why use a fresh fish compulsorily when you're still going to keep it locked up for four months? Number six. They used perfumed oil to bathe instead of soap. Now we are back to the ancient Romans' hygiene. You already know they took it seriously, but how did they bathe when soap was not in existence? Almost daily, they would visit the public bathhouses for both social occasions and to wash away the day's dirt and grime. If they couldn't make it to the bathhouse, some Romans would lather the essential oils on their skin along with olive oil and scrape it off with a tool called a strigil. Soaps were not around in the times of the Roman Empire, so instead, they rubbed olive oil all over their bodies and then scraped it off with a strigil, as stated earlier, carrying away all the dirt and grime with it. This leaves their skin silky and moisturized. As a plus, olive oil was often scented like perfume, which would leave behind a sweet smell after it was gone. But what is a bath without soap? Now, it's time for today's subscriber's pick. This image looks awful and makes you wonder what is going on here. Obviously, from the list that we have already presented, there were some really disgusting practices that were considered to be normal in ancient times. What do you think was the most disgusting practice so far? Do you know of any others that we left out of our list? Let us know in the comments section. Number 5. 
animal dung was used as medicine. When it comes to the treatment of wounds, the ancient Romans did not depend on gauze and bandages. They used animal dungs instead. The Romans believed that animal dung has healing properties, which is why they used it to treat different illnesses. This is not limited to a social class, as both the middle class, upper class, and lower class used it. Almost everyone participated in the collection of animal dung. When they do, the dungs are sun-dried to preserve their nutrients. Once dried, they get stored until needed for medical purposes. But that's not all. Animal dung was also used as a source of energy. The Romans cooked the animal dung and added it to their drinks. That practice was done to boost the energy levels of the people. No matter the amount of energy it contains, no one wants to have anything to do with animal dung. Number four, public executions were entertainment. We have discussed the level of brutality in the execution of humans in ancient Rome. During that discussion, you might have imagined that people would feel sad during these executions, but no, maybe not all. Public order in ancient Rome was a priority for the elite, who contrived a range of gruesome punishments for purportedly serious crimes deserving the death penalty. As a result, a day of fun and games at the Colosseum involved performances of all kinds, including the public Roman executions, each more gruesome than the last. The Colosseum was in full use for over four centuries, and the programs of games and shows never changed. It was usually held during lunchtime when people could watch the executions of those who had committed serious crimes. It was also the time that gladiator fights took place, but the execution was more important, just so everyone could see the consequences of committing crimes. Number three, olive oil, honey, and wool were used as contraceptive. Contraceptive has been in use for a long time. It's just that the methods used by the ancient Romans are kind of weird. At the time, it was the woman's responsibility to take care of contraception, rather than the man's. If the Roman woman could take the pain of breastfeeding for about two to three years, it would have a natural contraceptive effect. A funny method is the one where you have to cut open a type of hairy spider, which has a very large head with two small worms inside. If the worms are tied onto women with a strip of deer hide, allegedly they will not conceive for a year. There's another where they wash up with vinegar douche after copulation. Washing facilities were always supplied in brothels, where women needed not to get pregnant as this would lead to a loss of income for the brothel keeper. But the barrier methods included smearing on spermicides such as elephant dung, rancid olive oil mixed with honey, myrtle oil, and white lead, and blocking the entrance of the uterus with a clump of fine-spun wool. Too much of a problem. Did it work for them, though? Number 2. Toga Whitening with Sulfur Fumes Toga was very common in ancient Rome as a flowing outer garment worn by the people. Usually, the toga comes in white color, which requires a whitening agent to keep it clean. But how did they do this? In ancient Rome, pots were left on the streets for men to relieve themselves. The reason was not a matter of hygiene. No, not in the way that you think. The pots on the streets were placed there by Falonica, which were commercial Roman laundries. Periodically, the contents were collected by the workers for cleaning the classic togas and newly woven wool to be made into fabric by removing its oily lanolin content. That's not the complete way, though. As you must know, the urine contains ammonia. Putting ammonia in water is alkaline, and alkaline solutions are effective cleaning agents because they can break down fats into soluble fatty acids and glycerol. Since many stains are of the greasy variety, Ammonia solutions can be effective cleaning agents. Clothing was placed in a tub of well-aged urine where it was trodden upon by the barefooted workers. After that, the clothing was rinsed in clean water and sometimes placed on a wicker frame over a pot of burning sulfur. As sulfur burns, it produces sulfur dioxide, which is also an effective bleaching agent. Number one, they used phalluses as lucky charms. This is not just the last on the list, but also the height of it. Do you know what phallus is? A phallus is an erect male reproductive organ, mostly made into sculpture, jewelry, rings, and so on, to signify dominance or male potency. One thing that's common to ancient Roman art is the display of so much sexuality. It was even deemed so inappropriate by 19th century audiences that in 1849 the doorway was bricked up. No wonder the phallus was an important art in ancient Rome. The Roman phallus was used as a lucky charm and as a way to ward off evil. You would mostly find them on Romans as jewelry. 
The good luck charm wasn't just utilized by men, but also women wearing hairpins ornately decorated with phalluses to adorn themselves. You can also find them as pottery and wind chimes. The phalluses as bells were hung up in various places across the household so that the wind would cause the bell to ring and dispel evil. That way they believed they kept positivity from escaping while they ward off evil from coming in. There you have it. Twenty ancient Roman bizarre and disgusting practices were considered normal. Which did you find most bizarre? Let us know in the comments section. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.